Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 425, featuring Adam Martin, who is one of the co-founders of Macroverse, a fascinating company that I'm going to get to momentarily. But first, we should know that uh, Adam has actually had a long career in Hollywood. Uh, he's been an assistant director for over 25 years. In fact, one of the shows he did is Barry, a show that I really love on HBO. Definitely watch Barry. You know that it's a really great show because I talk about it constantly. Uh, but also, uh, he's done some really other interesting things. He was looking for ways of expanding his creative input uh, and, and creative writing and, and contribution to, to, to storytelling in a lot of ways and um, started to expand into the comic book world and started realizing the comic book also had a little bit of a barrier to entry in the way that they were uh, being published. Uh, and so he decided to start Macroverse with uh, several of his friends. And it's really a means of creating a, a digital comic book experience that's really pretty cool. Cool, uh, more than let's say an, uh, a PDF on an iPad, as he describes it. Uh, but as that actually started to succeed, uh, as you know, starting around 2020, he started to look at the opportunities that uh, uh, NFTs had to offer, and started to put, integrate that as to part of the platform as well. And that sort of enables uh, people to be owning part of the, the 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 comic book experience through NFTs, but also enables them to be part of the creative uh, input as well in storytelling. So it's really fascinating, really get into it. It gets pretty complicated, but uh, honestly speaking, Macroverse is a fantastic platform. I've actually been uh, checking it out myself. I've gone to, to their Discord, which I definitely recommend you do, and the link to the Discord will be in our show notes, so go check those out. Uh, we also talk a little bit about a lot of other things, like how AI is going to change the graphic design, uh, graphic novel world and, and what his thoughts are on that. So really, really cool and very interesting. Uh, and I highly recommend uh, checking out their stuff. In fact, he has even given me an incentive for you guys to do that. You can get one month for free uh, to check out their uh, uh, Macroverse, uh, which is available on iOS or Android. Uh, and it's basically the, use the promo code, go to the following site to check it out. So go to macroverse.world slash free month. And that is uh, an exclusive uh, free month for our CG Garage listeners. So go check it out. Again, that is macroverse.world slash free month. All right. Uh, we don't have any announcements right now in terms of uh, chaos uh, events or products right now. There were a little bit in a, in a, in a silent spell. Uh, more will be coming up very shortly. And I'm very excited to uh, share that with you. Uh, but for now, if you want to know more about the podcast, you can just go to chaos.com uh, slash CG Garage. You can always follow us on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash CG Garage Podcast. Uh, and if you'd like to watch this podcast, which I also highly recommend, you can go to our YouTube channel, and that is youtube.com slash chaos group TV. Uh, we actually got this uh, podcast, again, as a suggestion. We've been getting more and more of them, and I really love them, so keep them coming. If you'd like to have any suggestions on podcasts, just go to uh, email us, labs at chaos.com. But for now, please enjoy episode number 425 with Adam Martin. Welcome to another CG Garage, where the chaos group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. I've been following uh, you know, with great interest, I did a lot of big series of NFT stuff last year on, on uh, out of seeing what's going on, and the idea of the promise of a Web three studio uh, mm. existing was always very intriguing, uh, and I definitely want to get to that. But yes. you have a history. <laughs> you have a history in the film industry for much longer before Web three. So tell us a little bit about your history. What's your background? Oh well, yeah. No, well, hey, thank you so much for having me here. It's it's exciting, and it's, I was uh, well, it was obviously given the kind of uh, lots of visual effects people that that listen that listen to your show and all those things. It's uh, right. It was exciting to get to talk about some of that stuff. It's so yeah. I um, have been in. I've been an assistant director, a first assistant director for golly twenty five years or something now. Right. Um, so obviously, well, you know, directors guild, all that, all that fun stuff. Uh, started as a PA. Uh, Got a job as, on a terrible little film uh, 25 years ago as a director's assistant, and uh, okay. uh, 
and but just loved it. I had got a physics degree of all ridiculous things and was like, <laughs> you know, my brother was uh, older than me and is a is a producer and a writer himself, and so he had he. When I graduated, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And he said, uh, well, come on out to LA, it's fun. So I did. <laughs> and, okay. uh, you know, met, hooked up on this terrible movie, um, but got along with the first AD really well. And he was right. John Frankenheimer's first assistant director. Oh, uh, wow. And they were gearing up for this movie called George Wallace um, off for TNT 20, golly, 26 years ago now, uh, if I'm thinking okay. back. Um, and so we, you know, kind of figured it out and I came back and started that show as a PA and, and, oh, sorry, met my wife on that show and we got married, hooked up with a rap party, got married three months later and it's been, it's been in LA since then, basically kind of working my way up the, up the film industry. Yeah. That's amazing. I've, you know, as a visual effects person, I know that the almost important person I need to become friends with on set is the first AD because <laughs> I ain't going to get anything done if it doesn't get approved by that person. And uh, you are a timekeeper of how much time things happen on set because got to go, go, go. Oh, we got to, always got to go. And yet yeah, always try and, and make sure people have time to do what they need to do. You know, it's I know. Like, so I just make sure I'm really catch, good right? friends with you before doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's funny because I did the original, I was the second second AD on the original Transformers back in the day, 20, what, oh, 16 wow. years ago now. And mm -hmm. that was, I feel like, when I really learned what it took to produce visual effects at that scale. You know, I'd done smaller shows before then, I'd done some stuff, but nothing like that. Um, yeah. And Scott Farrar, I believe, was the was the kind of on-set coordinator there and, uh -huh. and just working very close. As the second second on those shows, you know, you kind of end up working very closely with everyone. And it was... It was a huge, an amazing experience on many levels, but a huge education in, in visual effects. Yeah, I, I, I bet, I bet. Uh, well, okay, that's wonderful. So, so you, you've done some amazing shows. So, obviously, you mentioned Transformers. What are some of the other uh, great features that you worked on? So, just recently, very few features actually. I've been on TV recently, but so my last show was Barry. I did Barry season three. I love Barry. Um, it's one I, of my favorite. It's completely. I, it, it's it's just best. incredible. No, it was mm -hmm. one of those things. It was purely luck. I actually moved. I live in Panama now. I moved to Panama kind of mid-pandemic. Um, wow. So I come to and for work, and you know there were a kind of concatenation of events that, that led to this this move. But so I got a call. I was you know at my house here in Panama, and uh, got a call from one of the producers on Barry saying. It's a couple of you know, a year and a half or so ago now saying uh, mm -hmm. we're meant to start filming next week. One of our first ADs just fell out. We need someone to step in. Can you can you come? And I mm -hmm. met uh, it was Alec Berg was going to be my director. I was going to do three episodes with Alec and then Bill Hader wow. was directing the other five for season three. And mm -hmm. I'm, you know, Alec, I, uh, Silicon Valley is one of my favorite shows of all time. So yep. it was one of those wonderful moments of interviewing via Zoom and just being like at the end of the interview saying, look, I don't mean to come across as obsequious, but I'm just a huge fan of yours. And I, whatever happens with Barry, I appreciate meeting you. And and he is just one of the sharpest, funniest people's, people that I met. I mean, he was just an incredible person. Uh, and the show Absolutely. was amazing, as was Bill, as was top yeah. to bottom on that. That production was just, just incredible. Yeah, I think it's a it's a it is a it is a fantastic series, and I've absolutely adored it. So what I found out that you worked on Barry, and I was like, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of, of what that show is, but I highly recommend season four. Is just, it, all the reviews are starting to come in for season four now, so excited about that. Okay, so Barry was the 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 uh, obviously something really wonderful that you worked on. What sort of where where did the where did a Macroverse sort of start to f f become a permeate. reality for you <laughs> yeah yes. permeate yeah seep yeah. in seep into the atmosphere yeah you know i for me it was um i mean going back years now so my, my like i said my brother was a writer my stepfather was a writer and my mom was a film critic which is kind of one so my dad my dad was a diplomat so not you know so we traveled around a bunch but but kind of i think you know, literacy, literature and entertainment and movies were always kind of part of just my upbringing. Um, mm -hmm. And, but I never thought about it as a, I always thought, oh, you're a writer and a director, but I never thought about the kind of other stuff that happens. And so it was this, this revelation for me when I realized, oh my goodness, there's another, you know, 200 people working on these things, 400 people, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But so I think like many people, I moved to LA with creative aspirations. So I was like, great, I want to, I want to come here, I want to start working. I love being on set, but what I want to do be doing is kind of writing and producing and kind of work my way up that to, to directing, work up that ladder. Right. And of course, what you know, you realize you get settled in LA and you start working and then you start climbing the the, the assistant directing thing, and then you have a family and you have a house. It's like, oh wait, the time that I was putting into doing these other things, I'm now 
having to keep working and there's no family, which is more important. So I found myself, you know, I think like many people, you arrive and then you kind of feel yourself veering from the course you thought you were into this other thing and love assistant directing and just like, you know, the chance to work with a lot of incredibly talented people. And there was always that kind of creative itch there um, for me. And so... I met my other partner, my business partner, uh, Eben Matthews, who has an illustration background, had his own kind of you know, branding and design agency. And we mm-hmm. met and started kind of got became friends. And then we realized we had the same place in movies. So we started writing together and we you know, lucky enough to get a couple of scripts optioned and, and, you know, kind of do some of that, that LA thing. And then realized that, that a, the script we had got torpedoed because another project came along that was much bigger than ours and, and kind of sucked all the wind out of that, that part sure. of the business. And we also realized, you know, watching my brother as a screenwriter, just time and again, successful, doing very well, but, but you know, would sell a script and then it would sit in the shelf and he'd sell another script and it would sit in the shelf. And look, amazing that he's selling those scripts, but just there wasn't, and we're talking to him and there wasn't that sense of creative satisfaction about seeing this kind of thing that you had created really come to life. And as we were starting to kind of wrestle with that, my partner produced, um, you know, the film, The Boondock Saints? You remember that movie? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, uh, Sean Patrick Flannery, pre Walking mm-hmm. Dead, Norman Reedus, great little mm-hmm. edgy Bostonian thriller, right? Action thriller. Right. Um, huge cult hit. Um, my partner pitched and produced then a comic bridging the two movies. So we produced like the comics, the comic series for the Boondock Saints. And Mm -hmm. it was A, incredibly fun getting to do that. And we did the convention circus together and we got the thing, but it was also this incredibly, just a frustrating process going through the kind of traditional print publishing thing and getting to the publishers and doing the books and getting in the blah, blah, blah. But it gave us both that that itch again, having grown up with comics, it gave us both that itch and that realization that hang on, we've got we've got these scripts that we've written, we've got these ideas kicking around. What if we actually don't just try and sell them and join that litany of people trying to do that in Hollywood? Why don't we produce them as comics? We know we can do something interesting here. Let's let's start doing that. And then, but again, having had the experience with Boondock Saints, it was well. We don't want to go the traditional route because that's a pain in the neck. Even with an established brand, that was a pain in the neck. And everything's moving digital anyway. So what if there's something that would feel native on, on, on kind of for, for mobile users, basically, if it feel native on a mobile phone that wouldn't just be kind of a PDF on an iPad. Like that's just kind of a crappy right. reading experience. And so we took one of these ideas that we had we had, had called Dead Town as a film noir zombie project. And mm-hmm. we had met an artist and doing uh, animation, doing like motion comics on, an, on a, for an agency job that we had. And uh, we said to him, you know, how do you feel about drawing zombies? And he goes, yes, that'll be amazing. So we started creating this thing and we developed this tap story concept, which brings this kind of cinematic feel to comics on the phone. Um, mm-hmm. So you tap one side, the story progresses forward, you tap the other side, it goes back. But what that allowed us to do was create dialogue in a meaningful way through this experience because you're not constrained by the parameters on the page. It allows us to tell slightly richer stories and richer characters. And I mean, not to say anything against the printed page, of course, but developing that app for that series with this artist, we were we suddenly felt like, wait, we've cracked. This feels great. And if we like it, chances are other people will like it too. And so we started going after a lot of other independent creators. Um, but it really did stem from, well, I kind of don't, I kind of want to see what, what we create up on the shelf, up, up, up out in the world, you know, not just sitting on a shelf. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, but, you know, tell us a little bit more about, you know, obviously there's a, there's a problem with Hollywood. You seem to identify a problem with Hollywood. What do you think the problem with Hollywood is right now? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's, I think it's the problem that a lot of, creative media comes into. I think you've got increasing consolidation um, and then a kind, I mean, I think you have an HBO that knows exactly what they want to do. And even, you know, I think there's some problems, there's some pressure there, obviously, given what the, the what we've seen happening with the shows disappearing from that. Um, and then I think you've got these other kind of big players like Amazon and Apple coming into the space who uh, I think don't always have a clear idea about what the kind of shows they want to be producing. It's like, you know, you used to know, right, I'm going to go on ABC. Here's an ABC 
drama, here's an ABC comedy, here's an NBC version of this. Whereas I feel like it's got a little more amorphous. Um, and fundamentally, there are, I think for, for people trying to break in and be creative, on the one hand, you've got actually more opportunities to do that than ever. You can, if you can be creative, you've got, I mean, between YouTube and TikTok, and so there's an incredible amount of, 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 of great creative coming out, but it's still this incredibly narrow pipeline to get anything actually kind of made at a significant level. Um, mm. And so finding ways to get creators, part of what part of what drives us is finding ways to kind of give creators exposure in a broader realm and a potentially a global realm digitally, really without the without the gatekeepers in the same way, um, but using that then as a hopefully as a conduit into more traditional film and TV kind of expansion. Uh, I think that's that's what we're trying to do, and I think that circumvents some of the issues that that one sees in traditional Hollywood. And then I think the advent of blockchain technology and smart contracts and things like that, again, right now, I think it's about ownership and about provable ownership. Um, but I do think there's also, you know, Hollywood accounting is famously uh, opaque, shall we say? Um, <laughs> yep. So, you know, I think if you could be doing things like that on a smart contract level where it really is, great, this money is coming in, it's automatically divided up and here's what happens and here's how it goes. And it's completely transparent. Everyone can see those numbers. Um, I don't think you're ever going to get kind of total transparency, but I think it can go blockchain tech as a as a as an option. I think can move us in the right direction. Okay, so what what would you say? Uh, what what is your business model? How does how does how does your how does Macroverse work? You know, as as a company globally <laughs> financially. Yes. So we have a couple of different things. Basically, um, we have a straight up subscription app for comics. So it's downloadable, it's up on the app stores now. Um, and that's one route. So it's a flat monthly fee, $4.99. Come in, read everything you want. It's all, you know, this tap story format. Um, lots of content ranging from kind of horror to, to whatever. Um, so that's the kind of, you know, basic you know, dist distribution model. And then what we think of are things of, we think of uh, people coming in really kind of falling on a on a on a, on a spectrum of of engagement. So I think there is just the fan at the one end who wants to come in and you have your Netflix subscription, you have your HBO, whatever. You just want to come and enjoy content. And then mm -hmm. as you go up across that kind of participation spectrum, you get into more people. You know, the kind of great. Now you're a super fan of this show, so now you're really engaged by this thing. So maybe you want more more exposure to the to the to the creators. You want uh, specific collectibles, experiences, those kinds of things. All the way up to on the other end. Great. I want to actually be a. I want to be creative. I want to do this. I want to be working in this space myself. And so mm -hmm. what we have is the kind of subscription app at the one end, which is downloadable, super simple. And then we are producing these series now, kind of stacking up these series of releases for NFT editions of these comics. So kind of special editions designed again for experience on the web or on the iPad, uh, unique collectible traits, different tiers of value, different, different you know, you know buy a comic and it's the kind of black and white version versus the color or it's the different, it's the foil thing or it's the behind the scenes content or it's all this stuff that we mm -hmm. can kind of build into this digital collectible package. And so we'll be releasing our first slate of those at the end of April. Um, and then, you know, we've got- another, As NFTs. As NFTs. We've got another stack okay. kind of coming behind. So we'll have these kind of two, you know, there's the kind of super collectible limited edition ones and then there's the broadly available, anyone can go see them. Uh, on right. both ends, you know. So, so membership, like, uh, so the membership itself, like, if you just get the app and you pay four ninety nine, that's not through an NFT. That's just that's not through up. an NFT. Straight right. standard web, you know, Apple Store, Google, you know, Android Store thing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So well, that's um, interesting. Now, are you guys mostly focused on on a comic experience right now, or are you thinking we, uh, of expanding? We are. So right now, we are focused on comics. Um, simply because a we love the medium, but also it's a very it's a kind of easy access and easy it's an easy way into media because what, as we do with every comic that we create or we help to have created or adapt or whatever it might be works in multiple formats. So we you know we create it in such a way that it'll work for the mobile phone, it'll work for a tablet, it'll work for web, it'll work for print, um, and then we can take it on up where. 
And then the other thing that Eben and I have is a lot of experience in audio dramas as well. So podcast, you know, fictional podcast. So okay. that will be the next step. We'll be doing audio series based on the comics. We've also been experimenting with this kind of hybrid animation style, which is really, it's very, you know, it's it's the comic panels, but we're adding narration and sound effects over the top of those to gotcha. create this kind of middle ground. And yeah, then- Maybe a little parallax. <laughs> ex 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 oops, sorry. I'm it's gesticulating okay. with this thing on my face. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's, you know, yep. and that's, you know, so we have a, we've done a lot of animation as well. Well, um, we've done, we did the last, we directed the last, uh, uh, there was a creep show Halloween special that came out kind of mid pandemic in you know, 2020. Um, and then we've done a lot of stuff before that. So exactly like we're approaching things so that we can then adapt them for animation as well. Um, yeah. Right, 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 right. So it's interesting, you know, I mean, there, there's, uh, what you've uh, presented is, is somewhat novel, but I've actually heard a lot of people saying that they've got these ideas of creating uh, Web3 Studios, and it seems to be, it seems to be very uh, popular in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, well, obviously, since the, you know, the, our current uh, crypto winter, it's been a little bit quieter uh, <laughs> in terms of that, that process, but there was sort of this, this dream. I went to NFTLA uh, uh, last year. Yeah. And they were, you know, it was like, get rid of the middleman, right? Get rid of the middleman was this, the, 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 the process that was sort of explained it, you know, get money directly from the fans and they own part of it. And therefore yes. it's, it's like, instead of one guy getting all the money and giving a little bit here and there, it's yep. everyone gets all the money. <laughs> yes. Right. Right. Is Slightly that sort of the it. idea that you have for yourself and, uh, in terms of what you guys are going to do? Yes. Uh, we, you know, we obviously... We've got to be, especially given what's happening um, post FTX and the blowups that have been happening. It's like discussing NFTs as securities or as investment vehicles is very, you know, it's it's. We would not claim that. What we do do though is work when people, especially with with images and things, you know, PFP projects that we've been involved with, comic series that we've kind of had and, and created around these things. We have licensed characters that people own back from them. So it's simply you know, you retain this and then we pay you a percentage because of the license. We will be then building this into the smart contract that as your things sell, as anything associated with your character sells, you are then automatically given a piece of that back. So absolutely. That's Interesting. a big part of what we're doing. And it's been it's been very exciting in some of these communities dealing with people who are not who have you know, aspirational storytellers, but have never actually done it before and coming in and teaching some storytelling and then working in these communities to to develop these things out and to get to, you know, take ideas from a, a paragraph in a Discord channel to great, now here's kind of an eight or a 10 page or a 12 page printed edition of your material has right. been exciting, incredibly exciting for people, um, as you might imagine. Um, yeah. So yeah. let's 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 explore that. Let's say let's say I'm a I'm a person who has a story that wants to be told. Yep. And I've had that story for a long time, and I've you know I've written part of it, and I've I've hashed around through it. Uh, I maybe even had gone to the to, uh, to studios and uh, you know done the water bottle tour of Los Angeles, <laughs> and 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 still didn't manage to 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 necessarily sell the project. Mm -hmm. But I still feel that there's an interest in this. Everyone tells me it's a great story. Yeah. Let's pretend that's a fictional story, but yes, we'll keep because <laughs> no one in Hollywood does that, right? No, no one, one in Hollywood does that, right? Right. So, so tell me, so let your your platform comes along, right? Yeah. How do, how does like where what how do I go to you, and how are you different than me having to present this to like an agent or someone or, or an agent, agent or those things? Yeah. Yeah. So what we, two different things for us. One is the we are connecting constantly, connecting people within our community with. with artists and and writers so we are those connections are kind of happening organically mm -hmm. um there is within the community right now at least there is a kind of pitching process and so it depends on where ideas come from and where they fall but it is okay great there are these people who have these 20 different ideas that have come in community let's go and vote who which four of these should we take up and, and and produce as it were, even as a short okay. or whatever. Well, great, then the community will come, they'll vote the, they'll vote for this, and then we'll we'll green light a handful of those into production. Um is that kind of like a DAO? Um it's similar structure to that. We haven't gone full DAO yet, so we do still we do ultimately still control it, but we okay. do give over certain production elements, so, so you know, choices like this to 
to the community itself. Right. Um, and then we are, this is not in the first stage of the, of the, the platform that we're building, but the mm-hmm. next iteration of it will have its own just open marketplace. So that again, anyone who wants to come and publish and do this thing on the blockchain and prove them, prove their own, you know, prove their ownership of this idea that they can, great, that can just happen automatically. They can do this, take advantage of this tap story system that we've set up, automatic distribution on the app, come in, sell it as NFTs, fund your own thing and kind of go from there. So that's okay. the, you know, we are right now, yes, we're still a little more traditional because we are we are still kind of filtering stuff as it's coming in, but we're mm-hmm. moving rapidly towards, to, you know, open, open borders, open system. And then as people get excited, as good stories come in, well, great, those can get pushed at the top kind of constantly for, for, distribution for sale for everything else and we've got relationships I mean, like many people do but it's you know we've got relationships with agents and managers and those kinds of people so it's like great these ideas now are, are gaining traction you know we can if if it's needed we can assist with with some of that kind of upsell and push as well okay okay yeah. well i do remember it was interesting i had a i saw an interview with john waters ages and ages and ages ago uh, and uh, someone, it was right when uh, when HD camcorders were coming out, and uh, and he said, and they were like, it's it's kind of amazing that you know so at that time it was about a thousand dollars, which was really not that much money. Right. Uh, and so he's, now you, you can anyone can do a a movie with a camcorder. Yeah. What do you think about that? And he goes, I think it's wonderful that anyone can do a movie, but not everyone should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so it was kind of interesting. So if you start to to think about the 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 democratization of creativity, does that work? <laughs> Very good question, and I think you know now what we have seen is a couple of different. See, what we've seen is a few different kind of scales at this point. Um, mm-hmm. So on a on a small individual short story basis, which is, you know, we've got kind of quite, what have we got? 15, 16, 20 of these now in, in a few different kind of worlds um, with communities that we've we've worked with. And we have kind of worked with the community to establish the guidelines of this world. And then I think this is where it's a bit of a combination of both. So I think it's not the traditional, it's not the DAO structure. So it's not kind of totally open, you know, open borders. What sure. we have found works is working with a, a group of fans of a project or a community or whatever, um, we can work with them and define, here's the world, here's what we're playing in, here's the backstory, here are the rules of this world. Because I think obviously storytelling needs to operate within kind of boundaries, you know, especially I think inherent in the nature of, of comics, it's often kind of a sci-fi or a fantastical or there's those elements to it. But so mm-hmm. even in those realms, I like to have real set, whoops, set parameters um yeah. until it's the assistant director of me i just talk there yeah. um <laughs> it's uh and but having set those and having kind of discussed great there will be now this core story that's going to happen so we have this idea and we can even pull that so we have an idea of the characters that are involved who they are where do they come from have an idea of kind of long term where they're going great we are now going to go and write that story so we know what we're doing. We can write for comics. We can write for film and TV. But inside of this world that we've now created, you, anyone from the community can come and pitch stories into this world. And those can then be greenlit or not. Um, and so it's this combination of us taking control of the kind of core narrative of something with the community support while still kind of creating the space around it for people to tell short stories. And I think... You know, we've seen a huge we've seen a huge array of of material. We've seen a huge array of stuff. Some of it, sorry, my dog's barking okay. downstairs. Um, we've seen some really interesting, clever ideas that I would never have thought of, and some really imaginative stuff. And quite often, it needs honing and it needs some refinement. And you have to kind of pick in. And well, this doesn't quite work. And narratively you know, so we'll go in and fulfill the kind of editor function um in those situations mm-hmm. um and then you get some ideas that are just not very good and that's fine too we're never discouraging with that stuff and sometimes you know we had certainly had people pitch kind of three four five ideas and one of them was fantastic and that's the one that goes um but so 
I think to your point about not everyone should, I think you can get away with it. And, and again, I think for me, it, so much of it comes down to kind of scratching that creative itch. You can do it on a short form basis. And especially with comics, when you are, you have a talented artist involved and then you're producing it in this interesting way, you can kind of create an experience around it that is still enjoyable, even if the sometimes the story itself um, could potentially be, is not potentially as good as it otherwise, as it would need to be to carry kind of a bigger story, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. But it, I mean, it's at the same time, you know, like you were saying, is that you kind of need some, some, some guardrails and some, some, yes. something to make it work. Yes. But how is that, then how is that different than, than what people would do in terms of, um, you know, pitching this to a studio? <laughs> Just pitching to a studio? Yeah. I, to me, I think it's, you know, we've, we've done this now in two different communities. Uh, no, sorry, three, including our own. So meaning, you know, community meaning, in our case, we have a this dead this show called Dead Town. We released a set of zombies. People could you know you pick up you kind of create a zombie for yourself. You then pitch stories into this community to, about how your character ended up like this. Um, another community called Bushidos, which were these kind of sci-fi samurai idea. Um, and when we started out working with Bushidos, they knew they wanted to tell stories. They didn't know how. The guys who started the product just didn't know how. Um, and so. And these were specific like NFT groups? These or? were a specific NFT collection. Exactly. Okay. Um, these little PFBs, you know, they were kind of right. a classic close-up right. thing. Very cool art. The so artists, be like like uh, like uh, the Bored Ape Yacht Club. Like the Bored Apes, so exactly. Right, exactly. And, but they would make a, stories about their apes. So they would make a stories about their person. Samurai. Their, their samurai in this case. Right. Having been taught, you know, we would we would go in, we'd take a few weeks of just like teaching storytelling, and then these guys would pitch. And we were teaching these storytelling and, and kind of pooling opinions from 40, 50, 60 people at a time. Um, wow. And that is, I think, where the you need the showrunner. You need the person who's kind of able to be the manager, to listen to the ideas, to pull the things. Well, great. These three ideas will work. These kind of are a little off the rails. Let's steer it this way. Let's so you're kind right. of navigating the ship through these potentially choppy waters, shall we say? Sure. Um, so that very. everyone <laughs> gets heard. It can be very choppy. Yes. Yeah. Um, everyone gets heard. Everyone has a chance to pitch in. Different ideas from different people will still flow to the surface, and then but everyone has a chance to pitch. And then during the the short pitching process, it is not us making that decision at all. It is the community as a whole. So, right. you know, people would people would do everything from kind of a two line to a three page story pitch. Um, gotcha. And we would comment online, and everyone could see it, and everyone, and then it would be like, great guys, here's the voting page. Here's here's the voting day. Everyone. Everyone, make sure you've upvoted the, the, the right number, and then we announced the top six and and went into production from there. So it's certainly, I think it's not. There is still a level of kind of of having to go through the pitching process for sure, but I think right. it doesn't in this case come down to great. It's this one person that I've got to convince, you know, right? Or two people I've got to convince. So a little right, more right. egalitarian doesn't solve every problem, but a little more, a little broader. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Well, it is interesting, and I think it's it's kind of a, a, a an interesting idea. Now, what about you know you know there's been actually a lot of uh, of talk about you know studios in the streaming sense that you know they created too much, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they had to put on the brakes a little bit on certain oh, things. Oh yes. Um, and and a part of it is, and I was reading an interesting article. Someone was saying specifically that they feel that um, they were trying to look at the algorithm of what people are watching and just they want more of this, so make more of that. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And 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 then there was too much that, and then there was not you know, and right. that's like one of the reasons that they said you know as you as you mentioned before with HBO, I mean they they tend to sort of focus more on taste <laughs> rather yes. than algorithms. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so so with what you're doing, how where where are your gatekeepers? How does that? How are the people that sort of do that? Is that you guys specifically? Is that the thing that people are going to? We're going to go to them because we know they're going to give us. The, the the gatekeeping that we need to get high quality content out of this. And therefore, my NFT is going to worth, be worth more. <laughs> that's that's the thing, right? The halo effect of that is is what I think we're looking for. And, and I think you're 100% right, but I think Hollywood's done that exactly what you're talking about forever, right? It's, it's right. you know, you get 
why you get three catastrophic event movies coming. You know, you know, you get Armageddon and Deep Impact in the right. same year because they're here, or you get the pandemic movies, or you get the whatever. Like, yeah. I think you've they've always done those kind of wild swings. Um, mm-hmm. Always kind of wanted to see like a Ted Lasso Walking Dead mashup. Like that would have been kind of sure. fun. It's like the studios <laughs> desperate. Well, this is working and this is working. We stuff these things yep. together somehow, you know? Um, yeah. You know, I think it's two things. For us, it is, yes, we have a certain, we have a, we have a, a high bar for quality. Um, so everything that we have on the platform, everything we're looking at, everything we're developing, we are we are maintaining a very strict kind of, caliber especially from the art and obviously in the storytelling and all those things like we're we want to be known as that kind of high level producer um and what we're seeing is you know I, that is now rubbing off and we're seeing the effects of that in other as we talk to other projects and we're able to show people what we're doing i think there is an understanding that this is it's good um as far as you know, film and television goes, and as far, let me sorry back up a second. As far sure. as what becomes a hit or doesn't become a hit, that I think is still amorphous, right? We never quite know. But what we do know is we look at what we've got up in the platform. We do look at analytics. We look at the numbers we see, but we aren't making decisions about what next series to pick up or what to do or what to extrapolate. Oh, sorry, what to what to you know, kind of green light based on what is working currently. It's like more for us, it's actually, well, we don't have enough YA content. We've got a couple of great series that we love in the YA genre. Mm-hmm. Let's, but we don't have, we need more. Great, let's go and find some more of those. We've got a couple of great horror series, but we don't have a comedy. Well, great, let's go. So I think it's more for us, it's the kind of counter-programming model in a funny way um, than trying to chase the numbers. And with this, especially with these kind of short stories that we're producing, that absolutely then kind of does come back to great. We can we can produce a lot of short stories quite quickly. As those take off, if any one of those really pops, well, great, that does then give us some indication that whatever is being set up here works. So now we can dig into this a little bit more. So it's not like a, it's, I mean, it's similar to kind of a pilot program, but it's a little more, it's, I think it's a little more streamlined than that. Um, and working generally working within the confines of an existing world. Um, but we also, I grew up with 2000 AD. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a British comic series. And it's all these, you know, as opposed to kind of the American version of, you know, 22 page books all about the next door story or the next door, whatever. Right. 2000 AD was bigger format, five, six pages, five or six stories per thing. So you got this kind of lots of short form stories that then went over multiple arcs. And so sure. we're gearing everything up much more like that, um, where we can be producing these kind of anthology series and doing these short form things and seeing what clicks. And then when people bite and people get excited, then we can indeed hone in on that while still continuing to find and produce kind of good other content from elsewhere, you know? Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, and and I, I find it... Uh, I'm, 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 your comic book comic book seems like an interesting thing because it's it doesn't take a huge amount of effort to make. <laughs> yes. Yes. What are your thoughts on uh, on on uh, on the price of Hollywood <laughs> <laughs> budgets? <laughs> In general, you mean? Oh dear God! Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, right? Um, I mean, we've seen that very unfortunate kind of winnowing away of the kind of middle tier movie for the last 10, 12 years, right? It's like right. the 40 if you million, produce right? a movie for 20 million and under, you're probably in good shape. Or you're producing for 80, 100 million, 100 million and over. And right. that, you know, that, that kind of middle ground, I think is just kind of evaporating. Um, right. Which is, which is difficult because I think that's where the kind of serious dramas used to operate. Um, mm-hmm. or, you know, slightly more kind of adult fare used to operate. Um, I, you know, it's for the high, I mean, I was around, so I moved to Hollywood in 1997, right? And there was this huge thing then, you know, James Cameron had just made the most expensive movie for the second time because right. True Lies, I think, had cracked like 120 million. And that right, was and then bonkers. Titanic, yeah. And yeah. then he just done Titanic, which had just clipped like the $200 million production mark, as yeah. I recall. And that was just this, you know, shocking And he's number. done it again. <laughs> and he's done it again. 
Dear God. Uh, and <laughs> and yet the top three highest grossing of six highest grossing. I mean, it's insane. He, the, yeah. he, whatever he's doing, he knows that he knows how to get people to the movies. Um, yeah. You know, I got to give him props. Uh, but so I think that it it's and I think with what you were talking about earlier with the obviously the kind of explosion of streaming and everyone frantically trying to outdo each other by producing more content and spending more money to get more eyeballs onto your streaming platform um which was equated to well i'm just going to spend more and more and more and so you end up with amazon and a billion dollars for lord of the rings with a mm-hmm. what a 37 percent completion rate or something yeah i saw that yeah that's not great um that's not good yeah it's tough um and I didn't, I actually quite enjoyed the series. It certainly scratched the Lord of the Rings edge for me. Um, but, you know, um, you know, it, it, as the streaming services are going to kind of retrench, I think that those that money is going to come down. But I suspect it's going to end up getting focused on more bigger projects, which again means everyone at the small, kind of smaller scale, smaller end of things is going to get squeezed. I think we've seen the... You know, the idea of the Matrix would never be greenlit today um, because it's just right. this kind of ethereal, crazy concept and no one's going to take a $200 million plus swing on something that's an unknown property. Um, we certainly see comics as a way of, you know, establishing ideas and building a world in without the constraints of budget because it, you know, it, it costs the same amount to draw a, draw a scene with the two of us talking with a kitchen and a blank wall as right. it does to put you kind of moonwalking on a the side of a spaceship as it were floating in the rings of Saturn. Like sure. that doesn't make any difference at all. So you right. can, I think, tell, you can, for for people, I think especially in Hollywood who are used to kind of Hollywood budgets, and I've spoken to a number of writers who have who are kind of intrigued by this idea is, you know, those people that are used to, the constraints of the studio system actually being weirdly freed by writing in a medium like like comics um, is there is a learning curve, but it can be quite liberating at the same time. What I'm 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 sure you probably figured I was going to go this way, but what are your thoughts on that getting even that barrier to entry being even lower now with AI tools being invented? Oof. <laughs> That is going to be, I mean, AI, yes, uh, I think it's going to have a shocking effect on certain parts of the industry. I'm sure you're seeing it already hitting. Mm-hmm. I think I, I, if I was a concept artist right now, I would be feeling quite nervous um, unless I was you know, super high tier. Um, what we have seen, at least in the comic space now, uh, is there's no consistency to the art. So it's you can produce great looking stuff, but what it cannot do is produce the same character over and over again in these different poses in what in how you would need to tell a story. Um, and now, if you're doing storyboards or something, potentially, I, you know there that's going to be much easier because you don't need that visual consistency. Um, although for me, certainly, I'm sure you see this as well. It's sitting, there's no, nothing beats sitting in the room with a storyboard artist talking through the shots of a scene. And so I think no matter how good people are, that I don't think is going to go away anytime soon, um, even if you can do it by yourself digitally. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely concerned for, for chunks of the kind of, the, yeah, the concept, the concept and the previous world to some degree, I think that is going to get interesting. And I think, you know, increasingly we're seeing voice, if you've seen some of these voice AI tools as well, mm-hmm. where you can mimic, I mean, I listened to a the pod, you know, Seth Godin, the, 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 the author, right? He mm-hmm. had a podcast the other day that we listened to, my partner and I, my partner sent it to me and I listened to it. And it was great podcast, totally him, totally. And at the end of the podcast, he, it started off, he said, thank you. And then he came on and said, just so you know, that entire thing was written by AI and I programmed a bot to mimic my voice. And so you've just listened to, that was not me, that was totally AI. And right. that, I mean, that's going to get, you know, the the impact of that on voice actors could be really interesting. I mean, I think, mm-hmm. again, you're not going to, you know, you want this person's performance. You want 
Seth Rogen's performance on something. You sure. can't capture that. Even if you get the voice right, you're not going to get the, the performance out of it. And so I think that's, again, there's a level of people that are going to be secure, but yeah, I'd be worried at a kind of, you know, budget level, I, those tools are going to get used more and more. And I think you're going to, could be, could be damaging and concern me. Yeah. Do you see uh, that as well? Have you seen? You I've, know, yeah, absolutely. I have been your, having this conversation yeah. daily, like hourly, <laughs> constantly. Because <laughs> you know, but I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if you. Guys, I work for a company called Chaos. Yeah, uh, we make uh, we make uh, uh, software specifically used for visual effects, right? right. Yes. And so uh, uh, this podcast was a, a random idea I had, and somehow con- blossomed, and it's <laughs> going for almost nine years. So yeah, I'm not going to stop it. No. But but uh, but specifically the the way that that uh, 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 these tools are, are working, um, there is there is concern about that, uh, and it is it is either people are like, "Wow, another you know arrow in my quiver that I can use," <laughs> or yes. some people are like, "Screw you! You're stealing all of my work, and I can't believe my job is going away." Right? Yeah. Right. So there's a lot of that that's happening. As of well. course. Now, what right, is it's an your, arrow in the quiver or an arrow in my heart, right? It's yeah, one of those exactly. Two yes. the, yeah. That's a perfect yeah. way of putting it. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, the other one that's interesting is is the copyright issues. Now, remember specifically, comic book. A comic book was denied copyright because it used AI for its creation. What are your thoughts about that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, the AI copyright issue is. I think this is where hopefully we. This is where I do think you know true artists will I mean, true artists sorry original traditional artists. artists traditional artists will uh, continue to prosper is that AI right now can create amazing well it can it can source enough information to create the impression of something new and original right um, it is not actually creating anything brand new it's 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 aggregating information and, and creating this thing but i mean um, in a lot of ways people could say that almost all art is derivative and all art is, <laughs> and i think that's that absolutely can become i mean you don't you know if you're looking for inspiration you can be scrolling through deviant art and finding interesting sure. stuff or any of those things um you know we've seen now I, it's funny because i had forgotten that that case it's it's going to be very going to be very interesting to see how if it is if i guess it'll come down to if 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 i create a a, a, a comic whatever based on ai art mm-hmm. and you can demonstrably show these elements that i have that the ai went and found were taken from your art that you created that right. then I would be in breach of your copyright at that point. Sure. Right? Um, but if you can't demonstrably prove that, I suspect it's going to end up, I mean, I suspect copyright in that way gets very tricky. I mean, music obviously dealt, deals with this with sampling to a degree. You know, you can okay. you can choose, you know, you can use so many moments, so many seconds of this, but if you go beyond this, then you have to license the thing. I mean, you know, um, I don't have a good answer for that. It's going to be, yeah. But how does, how does copyright work for, or copyright or copyright equivalent work for Macroverse? Does it, is it sort of like the NFT is your copyright <laughs> because it's a smart contract? Yes. So with the material that we are producing, absolutely. Yeah. So, your copyright is attached to you know your your slot on the blockchain becomes your proof of ownership becomes your proof of origination and right. so you know when we decide we're going to publish something that you've created we will still sign a license agreement with you for that thing and if mm-hmm. we breach that agreement and we take off and do something else with it it's it's traceable on the blockchain back to you so right. we can't yeah we still we we cannot kind of fudge those numbers in the same way okay. um, as we could if it was just, you know. I mean, if you want to play that game, I suspect, you will always find a way around that stuff. But I think blockchain, sure. the traceability on the blockchain makes it makes it far harder to do that, far harder to pull the wool over creative eyes. Okay. 
Now, let's say someone pitched a really great idea to you, and then you find out later that it was a lot of it was created using AI, including the script was was helped, was assisted <laughs> with AI, and the drawings were assisted with done through AI. And then it, it, the the story itself is really cool. Yeah. How would that affect what you guys think about that in terms of Microverse? Is that a platform that, that 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 someone could say, "Hey, you know what? I have a really good idea. I just used a lot of AI tools to make this happen." I think. I mean. Ultimately, it's it's a very good question. It's we haven't spoken about this specifically internally, but we're we're kind of around the periphery of it constantly. Of course, um, you know it's to, you know I think to me it would come down to where if it is if the story is compelling enough, if the art is good enough, and it's not directly in con, you know, it's, it, and it's not it's not breaching copyright you know as we do our due diligence on on sure. the series to produce and Good. we cannot turn up great this story was stolen from x and y and z this is an original story that has now been used um to me again i think it, it potentially comes down to the cre you know we would we don't think twice about using photoshop tools we don't think twice about using yep. elements package and you know in, in in animation we don't you know these are all tools that other people create that we as creators can then use to enhance our own work yep. um you know it's it's i won't pretend that it's not a gray area but i also think ultimately it's going to become yeah, ultimately i think it's it's it i think it becomes another it becomes another tool it becomes another arrow in the quiver as you were saying yeah um and i don't think it's something that we would necessarily uh uh walk away from just because it was AI generated. Um, and we would consider that on a kind of case by case basis. Cause we're sure, 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 sure. <laughs> well, I think it's what's, what I find it fascinating. I mean, one of the, I mean, I go, I try to stay as neutral as possible on the subject of AI, but I have to, I constantly paying attention in it. But I will say, you know, I do absolutely hear the concerns of people. It's like, hey, you of know, course. they scraped art station and that's yeah. BS, you know, yeah. or whatever they want to feel. And it's like, at the same time, they put stuff on the internet, <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I understand the problem that's going on. But, um, oh, yeah. But at the same time, what, what I've noticed is the huge interest in art <laughs> yes. has happened. Yes. And not only – that's the first thing. And the second thing is people have really crazy ideas. Yes. And isn't that wonderful? <laughs> yes. Yes. You're absolutely right. It's funny because I think that has been one of the – right? Yeah, yeah. It's been one of the positives of the, of the interest in NFTs has been – you know, art used to be the kind of exclusive low de domain of the mega rich. It was like, oh, you knew you were super wealthy when you started collecting art, right? Like right. that was one of the barometers of it. Sure. And we're now, usually trying to dodge some taxes. <laughs> or, or exactly. I'm going to have my corporation buy this uh, Monet. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, ex ex still super rich, <laughs> but hey, um, you know, and I think you're right. It's like, that's the interesting, that has been, NFTs, I think, have made it accessible to a, an array of people who would mm -hmm. not normally be interested. And I think, you know, you're already looking at kind of generative art to a degree. You're having people writing programs to create, it, it, you know, variations on ideas, on concepts. So at what point does a generative art project become an AI project or the tools? The way, you know, I think it, it becomes the Venn diagrams in those 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 spheres. Oh, sorry, not those spheres. Those Venn diagrams of those different art kind of areas mm -hmm. of the art world, I think, overlap quite strongly. Um, and yeah, I think it has been a positive that people are excited about about art mm -hmm. and collecting it and and digital art up on the walls and kind of seeing more and more. And it's, yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, well, listen, I want to I wanna get people excited about some of the great stuff that are at Sun Macroverse. So please tell us some of the great projects you have on there, what people can see and, and what, what, are, what are some of the, some of your favorites that are oh. out there. Thank you. Oh, it's great. Um, so we have a series right now that we released that's the kind of new series on the app called uh, Darkland. Um, it's by a producer called Evan, Evan Shapiro. He was one of the creators of uh, Portlandia back in the day, been around yeah. the industry for a while. Um, he, uh, it's great. It's kind of, it's a black comedy, very black comedy, kind of Game of Thrones, but set in hell. Uh, okay. So it's this kind of power players and Michael and Satan kind of wrangling for the future of mankind. Um 
Very twisted, very dark, very funny. If you have a twisted, dark sense of humor, um, sure. you know, uh, it's going to upset a lot of people. It is upsetting quite a lot of people, which is great. Um, so Darkland is we're releasing on the app right now, uh, and then we'll be releasing kind of an eclectic edition of that coming soon. Um, we have our original series, Dead Town, which is kind of hardcore. Uh, this film noir zombie horror. Um, if, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's very directly inspired by kind of touch of evil as a visual touch point. Um, very oh, wow. rich, beautiful. Like we designed it to look like classic film noir. Um, and it's this private detective plying his trade, but in this post-apocalyptic world. Um, so that's very cool. Um, very pleased. That is one that we write as well. Uh, so I have to, to talk about that. Another <laughs> beautiful one called Remind, um, which is, it's actually by an artist called Jason Brubaker. And it's this, He's got this kind of beautiful Miyazaki-esque kind of illustrative style. Um, and it's this very lyrical story about a girl kind of see, looking for her father and, and trying to kind of connect with her father's crazy mission that he he disappeared pursuing and turns out that he was right. She thought he was crazy all along and, and it turns out he's right and now she gets embroiled in the same adventure. So it's very Miyazaki-esque, and, but just lovely. Um, Total counterpoint to the first couple of things. Right. Um, uh, the series called Hex 11, which is great. That'll be another one that we're releasing as NFTs. Um, that's this kind of, it's a, a world where magic is, you can be buyable. So it's like magic as tech. So you can buy magical enhancements for yourself. Um, there are natural magic wielders. And then you've got this kind of Blade Runner-esque enhancements that you can add to yourself and the conflict between the natural magic users and the corporations that want to control the magic and the blah, blah, blah. So very fantastical. Um, and then, yeah, this Bushido series we've got coming out as well, Sci-Fi Samurai. Um, that's going to be out very soon. It's this yeah, science fiction world set on a you know planet f- lot far, far away um, with a group, of, uh, a group of these warriors protecting the planet from their from their own, uh, from their own kind of originate, or, you know, their own origins, basically their own past coming back to haunt them. And uh, they now have to defend their new world from the old one. Um, Those all sound so amazing. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> sounds, sounds great. Yeah, thank you so much for 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 sharing those things. Uh, and you know, obviously, uh, is it just a Macroverse app? You can find that on on. Uh, yes, uh, Macroverse on the- Next Gen Comics on on everything, and then Macroverse okay. HQ on Twitter and everywhere, basically uh, Twitter, Instagram. Yes. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. Well, listen, uh, Hammer, thank you so much for your time on this. Uh, love to hear your thoughts on it. Very excited. I mean, how long has this been going? Like, it's like three years? Three years now, yeah. So we launched the kind of Web2 version of the app and then we ran into, you know, collectability and digital comics. Like, wait, hang on a second. Let's, this looks, this makes sense. So we've been kind of refocusing for the last 18 months around that. So yeah. Okay, um, wonderful. Exciting, and it sounds but- like the, the, the traditional Web2 version has been working okay for you as well, right? Worsening has been great. Web the, right. the traditional version has been great. So no, it, and it's yeah, it's a, it's a, it's we we're we're very happy with it. We love it, and it's uh, we're just kind of you know really now with this new launch of stuff coming, we're we're uh, excited for the next step. It's going to be cool. Well, perfect. Well, thanks so much, Adam. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much, Chris. It's such a pleasure. No, it's a great chat. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you.